Okay, Boker Tov. Good morning on this uh, chilly morning here in South Florida, for sure. And um, as usual, Sunday morning, we spend some time learning Torah. Not the usual, you know, 30 second or 90 second clip. But uh, let's relax. Let's learn some Torah. Let's get into it. Let's let's be inspired. So <clears throat> we're doing the class a little bit earlier today than usual. And that is because I have the honor and the merit to officiate at a wedding soon. Uh, yeah, a Sunday morning wedding. And what could be better? What could be better than being there to help facilitate the, uh, the first uh, one of the first mitzvahs, which is to be fruitful and to multiply, which happens, of course, through marriage. So to be able to be part of that is a is a wonderful uh, simcha, wonderful joy. So class today is abyssal, abyssal free, a little early. Um, but uh, that's that. Okay, so let's start with the usual mitzvah. Let's give a little tzedakah to bring forth and elicit Hashem's blessing that we should find the right words to inspire all of us. Then we always start with the bracha on the delicious coffee. If you have your own coffee, you could say the bracha with, together with me. If not, please answer amen. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech olam shakol niyabidvaro. We start with a story. It's an old Jewish classic. You might have heard it, but still, it uh, is an old Jewish classic and it is related to the theme that we want to discuss today. The story is told, you know, the Talmud states that a person should always make sure, le'olam yasim yasi adam et bito le Talmud chacham. A person should see to it that his daughter should marry a Torah scholar. I mean, it's a beautiful directive uh, <clears throat> and it relates to our discussion. No, it's when you have a perspective shidach, a perspective match for your child, son or daughter. What are the values you are looking for that your child should spend the rest of the li their lives together, your child with their bashert, and of course, its impact on the next generation, the grandchildren, which is a main objective of marriage is to produce the next generation with proper values, with Jewish values, with Torah values, with holy values. Says the Talmud, Olam Yasi Adam, a person should see to it that his child marries a Talmud Chacham, a Torah scholar. The most assured way, although nothing is guaranteed, we have freedom of choice. We still have to make uh, decisions and choices. But the best guarantee to make sure that you have the proper husband for your daughter with the right values is someone who is a Talmud Chacham Torah scholar. And this has been a tradition throughout our history. Now, <clears throat> the story is told on the that, and it pertains to our discussion today. The story is told, so therefore, Back up a second. Therefore, it was often the custom, uh, although I haven't seen that custom today, but it was often the custom that <clears throat> before agreeing to a shidduch, to a match for your child, the prospective son-in-law would first go ahead and be tested. He would have a private audience with the rabbi of the community who would test his Torah knowledge, and only after the rabbi would uh, give his consent and say, yes, I tested him, and he's a Torah scholar, he's, uh, he spent his time in yeshiva, not only warming the bench, but he studied and learned, would the shidduch be approved. So the rabbi's uh, stamp of approval was highly important. Okay. So <clears throat> this, our particular young man... Um, is about to go in and be tested by the rabbi. Before he does so, his father tells him the following. <clears throat> he says, you and I know that uh, you weren't the best and most diligent of students in yeshiva. Um, <clears throat> the girl I want you to marry is a very uh, sort of righteous and prestigious girl. 
and I need the rabbi's approval. So this is what I want you to do. I'm going to give you, I'm going to coach you how to answer the rabbi's question. Whatever the rabbi asks you, you should tell them, tell him that the answer to that question is in tractate Kiddushin, one of the tractates of the Talmud on page 51. The boy had no idea what it says on page 51. However, his father's instructions, fine. So <clears throat> he comes into the rabbi. And the rabbi asks him some sort of intricate uh, Talmudic question. And the boy says, ah, that is an amazing, beautiful question. And here is the answer. The answer is Talmud tract uh, Kiddushin, tractate Kiddushin, page 51. Now the rabbi, who is what we call in Hebrew, in the yeshiva language, a Bucky Bashas. He knows the Talmud backwards and forwards, and he thinks to himself, my questions, the answer to my question is not in Kiddushan 51, but the rabbi has some humility. He says, maybe I'm overlooking something. I'll try another question. He asks him another question, totally unrelated. And the boy again responds and says, ah, brilliant question. But that again, the answer to this question could be found, Talmud, Tractate Kiddushin, page 51. <laughs> Rabbi is like really puzzled and surprised. He says, maybe, maybe I'm going senile, maybe I'm going Meshuga. And he asks him another couple of questions. And at all the questions, the yeshiva boy responds, the prospective groom responds according to his father's instruction, Talmud. Kedushin 51. Finally, the rabbi is like really intrigued. He says, you know what? Maybe my memory is failing me. He says, I, let me go, let me go to the shelf. He takes out a tractate Kedushin. He opens up to page 51 to review. Maybe there's something, maybe he's mixing something up, which he opens up the Talmud and in there he finds a hundred crisp dollar bills that the father of the of the groom went ahead and snuck in into his Talmud, $10,000, and the rabbi sees the $10,000, and he proclaims loudly and with great joy, it's a shidduch, the marriage is on. So this is a story told as an old Jewish classic to highlight that, you know, we're not perfect, and... Um, <clears throat> etc. Don't need to explain. But <clears throat> it is addressing our topic, which is, do you want your children to be good people or successful people? And I want to get to a simple answer, a simple answer, but sometimes it is the simple that we need to highlight. And especially when we sort of interweave it and we and we and we see it of how it's mentioned in the Torah. It adds special, or it adds extra um, sort of potency, or it adds extra penetration. Because a lot of these things we know, we know, but it doesn't penetrate. It remains sort of on an outer level. And sometimes when we see this in the Torah, and we and, and it, it, it it hits home in a in a certain way. So let me let me let me give you the background of what we're talking about in terms of the portion of the week uh, that we just read yesterday, Parshat Vayechi, we just here read yesterday, and uh, we're going into Parshat Shemot. So in Parshat Vayechi, which is the last portion of Genesis, so let me, let me here read to you <clears throat> what it says in the actual Torah, and I'll give you also what something that Rashi tells us, and also something that is mentioned in the Talmud and in the Medrash. So this is the verse I always like to say, use the first, tell us the holy words of the Almighty. By Yikra Yaakov el Bonov, by Yomer he osvu v'yagidolochem eisa sheyikra eschem b'achar sayom. This is Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our forefather, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Yaakov. And he's on his deathbed. And before he passes, he is sort of instructing, blessing, guiding, even critiquing his sons, the 12 tribes. 
So here's a translation. <clears throat> Jacob called for his sons, and he said, Gather around, and I will tell you what will happen to you at the end of days. Now this is in parentheses because this is not the actual translation, but this is based on commentary and Rashi. But Jacob found himself unable to reveal the time when the Messiah would come, so he changed the subject. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so here, I want to refer to, let me see if he brings this here in the in this particular uh, Chumash, in this particular Bible, whether he brings this, this story, but he does not. So I will share with you from memory what the Talmud over here tells us, okay? So the Talmud over here tells us the following. <clears throat> the Talmud says that Bikesh Yaakov, Yaakov wanted to bless his kindalach to tell them the end of times, and the divine presence was removed, left him. And <clears throat> as every verse in the Torah has so many insights, here I'm referring to this particular insight as follows. The Talmud says that Yaakov was concerned, Jacob was concerned that the reason why he is not able to proceed with what he had intended to tell them is that perhaps they are not worthy of receiving the blessings that he's about to give them. Why would they not be worthy? Because their belief, their emunah, their belief in God Almighty and Hashem <coughs> is not wholesome, is not complete. Maybe they are lacking in that, in that commitment or in that belief. So <coughs> he said to them, perhaps... You guys do not have, you, my, my dear children, you're not there. You're not there where I want you to be in your connection to, to, to God, says the Talmud. And this is, by the way, the origin, the first origin that I'm aware of where we are, where, <clears throat> first origin for the famous, perhaps the most famous Jewish prayer, which is the Shema Yisrael. Shema Yisrael, right? So that the Talmud proceeds and tells us in Tractate Sota, the Talmud says this, says the following. He says <clears throat> that Yaakov turned to them and he said, perhaps your belief is not complete in the Almighty. And they responded and they said, Shema, they said like this, they said, they said, Shema Yisrael, hear O Israel, in this case, the Talmud interprets this to mean literally Israel because Jacob had two names. He had the name of Yaakov and he had the name of Yisrael, which he was given when he defeated the angel earlier in Genesis. And they're saying, Shema Yisrael, listen, our father Israel, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echod. God is our God, God is one. And to that, Jacob responded the prayer that we say right after the Shema, Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Olam Ba'ed, Blessed is the name and the glory of God and God's kingdom forever. And <clears throat> the Talmud adds that the tribes then said to Jacob the following statement. Listen to this closely, because this is very much based on what we're going to talk about today. The Talmud says, they said to Yaakov Avinu, to ja Jacob their father, just like in your heart there's only one, your heart is complete and, and total with your connection and your belief in Echod, in the one above, in Hashem. So too in our heart there is only one, the one Almighty and so on. So <clears throat> there's a question, which by the way, a, a significant part of this class is based on a lecture given by Rabbi, known as Rabbi Waiwai, Rabbi Jacobson, so I do like to give credit where credit is due. So, <clears throat> Rabbi, so the question that's asked over here, why did they have to say the first half? Why did they have to say, just like in your heart is only one, so too in our heart is only one, referring to the one and only? Why couldn't they just say the second half? Dad, you're concerned about our oneness in Hashem. We only believe in one God. Why did they have to add the first half of that statement? Just like in your heart, there's only one. 
So here we go, come to our question and the sort of crux of our class over here, of our discussion. And it is so important, and I know you know it. And you know how you know it's important and simple when it's so obvious. Okay. <clears throat> you know, there's a story told about a, <clears throat> a um, mother who tells her child, her young child, before getting on the bus in Israel, that's how, <laughs> in Israel, before getting on the bus, tells her child, make sure you tell the driver that you're only four years old. Why? We know why, right? This way you don't have to pay an extra fare. Okay, child is obedient, gets on the bus, the bus driver says to the child, Amata, Ben Kamata, how old are you? I'm four years old. Bus driver is not stupid. He understands what's going on over here. He says to him, tell me, when are you turning six? And the kid says, I am going to be turning six as soon as I get off this bus. <clears throat> they did a survey. Listen to this survey. I have the paper here in front of me. Let me read this. Okay. In a famous study, I don't know where the study is from, but I'm seeing it in an article here. He doesn't quote where the study is from. In a famous study regarding the transmission of values from parents to children, the, qual the following questions was asked of many children. What do your parents want you to be when you grow up? Rich? Smart? Famous or good? Most of the children from a variety of demographics and cultural sectors ranked rich, smart, or famous as most important. <clears throat> the characteristic they ranked lowest was being good. Ironically, I'm reading, Parents across the same sectors responded that they favored good as a preferred characteristic for their child. How do you explain the disconnect over here? <clears throat> How do you explain that the children somehow got the message that being smart, famous, successful is what their parents want from them, while the parents said, of course, being good. And here we get to something so fundamental the most powerful tool of making sure that your children grow up to be good, to be righteous, is the role model that they see in you. Which is why I bought the story of the rabbi who was willing to accept the $10,000 to proclaim the Shidduch how many of us <clears throat> have gone to, whether it's Disney or on a bus, and said to our child, go ahead, tell them you're two years younger so that I could save myself a couple of dollars. There was a principal <clears throat> or a dean in a school who said that, you know, parents will spend thousands and thousands of dollars in education. And then with one $25 or $35 uh, attempt of saving in a dishonest way, they have thrown out the entire thousands of educational dollars into the garbage, down the tube. It is a book that was written probably a number of years ago, probably 20 years ago. Uh, a book is, is uh, analyzing sort of, a, it's, it's, a, it's a Jewish book. Jewish book, I mean to say it addresses certain Jewish cultural Issues and it's called Off the Derech. I read this book years ago. Off the Derech means off the path. And the book focused on something that became more common then, 20 or 25 years ago, where children growing up in religious Jewish homes were, were taking a detour. They were, they were, um, abandoning the education of their parents. And so this, this author, I don't remember her name, uh, 
interviewed many of these sort of young adults, maybe in their late teens or early, uh, early 20s, and the most common theme that came up in her interviews was what caused the child to, um, <clears throat> to abandon, neglect, rebel, was the fact that someone in their life that was a role model and should have been a role model, maybe whether there was a principal, whether it was a teacher, whether it was a parent, did not live up, did not uh, act in a way that that uh, you know their 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 mouth and their teachings were one place were in one place and their actions were in, in another place. <clears throat> you know how. How often, how often, so uh, let me, let me back up. The impact that, that we have in how we behave when we are role models to our children is far greater than the textbooks and teachings that we give them, although that is important. I heard, I heard uh, Dennis Prager, some of you might know who he is. He's a conservative commentator. And I heard he said, you know, I heard him, he, he's repeated this several times. And, um, you know, he, while I don't agree with him to the full extent, but the, the point is a valid point and something for us to think about. He says when he raised his children, he did not focus. He never uh, he never asked them. I don't, let me back up. He he did not focus. The emphasis in the questions that he asked them regarding school was not what their grades were. His questions to them were, were you a mensch today? Were you kind? Were you a good person? That was what the, the message he sent to his kids is, I, I don't care as much about your grades. I care whether you are a good person today, how you treated somebody else. Now, the reason why I don't totally agree is I think grades are important. But I will agree that <clears throat> the message your child should get, both in your questions and in your personal behavior, is definitely more important than the grades. <clears throat> This is the deeper meaning. This is the deeper meaning of what the Shvatim, the, uh, the Shvatim, the, 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 um, tribes said to their father and why the Talmud tells us they didn't just answer and say, we only have one God in our, in our heart and mind, but they added, just like in your heart is only one, so too in our heart. What the Shvatim was saying to him, to their father, was you don't have to be worried about the fact that we only have one heart or one oneness of Hashem in our heart because that's what we saw in you. You were, were the truest, the, 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 the greatest role model in your connection to the oneness of Hashem. And therefore, you don't have to be concerned. It's not, we're not just proclaiming and, you know, sort of lip service that we only have one in Hashem. We saw it. We lived it through by you being a role model. There's a story told with the Rebbe Hashab, the fifth Chabad Rebbe. The Rebbe Hashab was looking for a teacher for his only son, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, who was later to become the sixth Chabad Rebbe. And he was, he interviewed various uh, potential uh, teachers for his child. And there was one particular Chassid, a Hasidic Jew, who was a fine individual, but to use the expression, ain't tocho kebaro, he wasn't as deeply committed on the inside as how he taught and he preached to his students. And therefore, the Rebbe Rashab rejected him as a teacher for his, for his son. The Chassid asked the Rebbe Rashab, and he said to him, look, 
what difference does it really make what I do in private and where I am exactly holding privately? Excuse me. As long as I teach your child the right things. And to this, the Rebbe Rashab responded. He said, <clears throat> I don't want my child to grow up in the same way where he will teach everybody else the right things, but he himself will not practice the right things. He will not practice what he preaches. <clears throat> A child picks up whether the teacher, the parent is real. You know, how often, and, th and this, is, this is a lesson to all of us, you know, not perfect in this, but this is the lesson. How often, and by the way, I don't do it. I want you to know, I, I do not do this, but I've seen it be done. How often does somebody call, I mean, to, you know, we're revealing our age over here. Today, today, you know, everybody has their personal phone calls, but some of the people listening to this class, my dear friends who are a little bit older, pre a cell phone where everybody has their personal phone. How often did somebody call the home and uh, someone else said, tell the individual I'm not home, right? I mean, what, what message are you sending to your child? This is just an example for those who are maybe 40 and older or 50 and older. What message are you telling your child? It's okay to lie. Why just can't you just say I'm not available now or I'll call back? How many of us have gone ahead as parents or as grandparents and uh, tried to get our kids into uh, Disney or on a bus by, by misrepresenting their age. What message are you sending? How many of us want and tell our children that we want them to be good people, righteous people? Do they see, I have my father-in-law of blessed memory used to say <clears throat> very beautifully, he says, in front of your children, you, you could brag. You know, you're not supposed to brag about your good deeds. It's supposed to be done in a humility, in, in, in a humble way and so on. But he would tell us, it's okay to brag in front of your children because your children should know and see who you are and what you're, what, what you're into. If, if you <clears throat> want, let's talk about the, the most important thing of them being a mensch. And another most important thing of them to carry on the Jewish tradition. You can't expect that you live a life where you're not exemplifying that being a mensch or you're not showing your children, you're sending them to Hebrew school, but in your personal life, they don't see you involved in any way, shape or form in your Jewish tradition or or much less so than your passion is when you're watching a football game. You're watching a football game, you're passionate, like who knows, all your neighbors could hear you shouting every time there's a touchdown or a fumble or whatever it might be. But uh, when it comes to opening up a book of Torah or some prayers, it's like they could sense that I'm doing this because I have to do this. There's no love, there's no excitement. Uh, there's degrees and there are levels and we all could improve. However, if we want, like Jacob wanted, to be assured that our children and our grandchildren continue the beautiful heritage and value system. I mean, today, and I share this often, today, you got to be blind. You got to be blind or, 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 or totally block a blockage of the, of, of the mind to not realize how important our connection to Torah values are. You can see in Western democracies the decline of values without a, a, a true, beautiful moral code. And the only way your children will be able to respond to Jacob's concern, the father of all of us, to, to his concern, do you have only one in your heart? Is God and godliness and holiness really the most important thing in your life? The only way you will be able to answer that question is not by doing something uh, that just uh, uh, assuages, that just, just, just sort of uh, makes you feel good. Okay, I sent them for two hours to school, to Hebrew school. Or this, again, this is a discussion to each one of us, whether from religious upbringing, less religious upbringing, it boils down to that if your children see that it's real, they see that to the teachers, it's real. It's not just they're hired to teach a subject 
but that's not their, their life. It's not who they are. It's not what they believe in. They see that you are a true role model when it comes to integrity, to being a mensch, to treat, sorry, to treating other people with respect and dignity, kindness. They see you get involved in charitable activities. This all boils down to, as often said, ben adam lemakom, ben adam lechavero, our relationship to God and our relationship to our fellow being. Yaakov's concern is answered when we can genuinely say, Keshem she'ein belibcha just like you, Jacob, were a true role model in what you taught to your children and grandchildren, when we can say that about ourselves, that the values that we want our children to, te- to, 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 uh, to in- incorporate or to absorb and to live by, when they can see those values in us, that's that we live that way. Yes, we're not perfect. And children understand that we're not perfect. But yet they know what is truly important to us, whether parents, teachers, and so on. When we have that, then and then can we be assured. And J- Jacob, as he learned at this week's Torah portion, on the one hand, Jacob passes away. On the other hand, it says, and Jacob lived and our sages tell us that Jacob lived even past his passing because his children were alive and they followed in his teachings and footsteps and beliefs. Then Jacob is alive. You are truly alive through your children and grandchildren when they adopt, incorporate, absorb, live the life that you have lived and the values that you live. And that is the key to the that is the main key to how to make certain that our children follow in the, in, in the path, in the belief system that we have in the Jewish path, in the beautiful path of Torah and Judaism. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful and blessed and meaningful week.